Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, apologies for a slight, slight delay this morning, um, but we're here, and it's great to be together to worship and to praise God. The psalmist says, Behold, how good and blessed it is when the brethren dwell together in unity. And uh, we are in unity this morning because we're one in Christ. So welcome to everybody, and um, it's lovely to be able to just join together. So let's just bring our time together to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come to you and we thank you for this opportunity this morning, again, of being able to worship together. Lord, we thank you that we can be one in Jesus Christ. No matter how different we are individually, we can be one in you. And Lord, we just pray your blessing upon this service this morning. Lord, we pray for all the different elements, and Lord, we just ask that you will be in everything that we do this morning, and Lord, we just uh, come to you, and we give our service to you, that you will bless each one of us, give us listening ears and open hearts this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to hand over to Joe and the band, and we're going to worship God in song. Morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to open with with the creed, which is a great opportunity to declare what we believe, uh, to declare our faith in God, and that is in fact what um, brings us together in unity, as as Dorothy was just praying. So let's let's declare our faith in God as we sing this song together.
because he can move the mountains. We praise you because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we praise you for the victory over death. Death does not have the last word. You have the last word. So Lord, we want to lift your name high this morning. And we thank you for everything that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Um, those of you who join with us regularly um, just may have noticed that uh, we have a different person with us on the stage today. <laughs> Mafalnery? Mafalnery yeah. uh, um, is a member of Blaze and um, is joining the band um, to, to help out and to sing. So we welcome you. It's lovely to have you with us, um, as it is always, with the band to lead us in worship. Um, we're going to hear from our young Barry now, and uh, Barry has done us our old age slot. So thank you, Jonathan. Hi, kids. Lovely to see you again. The last time we met, we were talking about God, the wonderful creator and inventor. Well, this week, or well, last time, we, we looked at the, uh, the mouth, this time we're going to look at the eyes. And I have to tell you, I sat on my glasses the other week and completely wrecked them. So fortunately, there was a bit of stuff coming through the post and in the packaging was this. And I thought to myself, this would be a crappy pair of glasses. This could be really clever invention. I could see sideways uh, as well as ahead. But actually, they're absolutely useless. So we'll chuck them away. No use there then. Well, let's get to it. Here's a quiz question. The, the eyes are wonderful, yes. How many working parts would you say that are in eyes? Did I hear you say 10, 15, 20, 40, 60, 80, 120? Any more? I'll tell you, two million. Now how's that for an invention? I couldn't believe it, two million. Well, there you go, how wonderful. Also, because it's a precious, wonderful thing, uh, we have God's protectors for us. Now, look, what are these? Well, the first is an eyebrow. This stops sweat coming down and dust. Another thing we have are lashes, and they're very much like the windscreen wipers on our cars. 
jolly useful and they wipe the eye from time to time and keep it nice and clear. Another thing, we have tear glands and these are very useful when we're very sad and tears are a real thing and they come from our eyes dripping down our face because we feel sorrow and sadness and Covid has been very hard and very sad for many, many people. Well, uh, the other useful thing is with tears and the tear ducts in the upper eyelid is that it, again, it's like the wash in the car, it squirts water and keeps our wonderful eyes clear. The other trick is this, it also blinks, B-L-I-N-K. Well, how many times do you think an eye blinks in, in, in a day? Five times? Ten times? Hundreds? Three hundred? Well, I'll tell you once again, because I know the answers, 10,000, how about that? Well, every day is a new day, but every day we have our eyes open most of the time, but at night we shut them, and it's a rest for our eyes, and we can go to sleep. But every day, there's a new day dawning. We open our eyes and we think to ourselves, what new adventures will we see today? Well, in fact, you may see nothing in this lockdown. We can't go here, we can't go there, we can't look at this, we can't look at that. I want to go on holiday to the beaches. I want to go to the Shard. If you've ever been up the Shard, that's a cracking place to be. Well, it's uncomfortable if you sit on the top of it, but you do get a cracking good view. And the London Eye, how oh, about that? That's called a London Eye because it sees a lot of London. So, good names, but we can't go there quite yet. Very frustrating. But I tell you something else. God has given us a wonderful video kit. All the things I've ever seen, I do forget some, and all the things I love to see, and sometimes some of the things I've not wanted to see, go into our video camera that's in our head. And even if we can't go to our favorite beach at the coast yet, we can actually see it in our mind's eye. How wonderful is that? Wonderful eyes. Now, moving on, the practical function of our eyes. Let's have a think of all the things they could do. If we crossing a road, this is one of the early skills we use with our eyes. Look to the right, look to the left, and all the rest of it. And then we've got reading we can do with our eyes, art, craft, cooking, driving skills, football and cricket. Let me tell you, if you want to play a decent game of cricket or football, if you don't keep your eye on the ball, you're not on the case. You've got to keep smart. And if you're a night watchman, let me tell you this, if you've got your eyes closed and the thieves come into your compound you're not doing a very good job so if you're a watchman keep your eyes open now watch out for each other do you remember jesus parable about the good samaritan the guys who walk by with their eyes closed to someone in deep need if you have your eyes open god loves us to go and help we see with our eyes a need and we do something about it well eh, the last thing we saw last weekend was the crucifixion of Jesus. That is a hard and difficult thing. And I want to tell you about this just very briefly. There was one guy whose tears fell down his cheeks for many days after Jesus was crucified. His name was Doubting Thomas. Well, we called him Doubting because he doubted that Jesus had risen again. His pal said, hey guy, We've seen him. We've actually seen him alive after his crucifixion. And he said, I can't believe it unless I put my hand into his nail prints and into his side where the, where the spear went through. I just can't believe it that he, he was killed. And all this time he'd been thinking in his video camera of this wonderful Jesus he'd been following for three years at least, he'd seen him do wonderful things and believed in all that he had done, that the last thing that ever would come to him was crucifixion. And he was so deeply sad, so deeply, deeply sad. Well, one day when he was with the disciples, Jesus appeared to him and said to him, notice that Jesus came to him and he looked 
uh, doubting Thomas and said, Thomas, look at my hands. Touch with your hand the nail print. Touch the side where I've been wounded. And with his eyes, he reached out and touched the body of Christ, the resurrection body of Christ. And he stood back, and I think he probably fell flat on his face. He said, with tears bursting out of his eyes, with joy and delight, My Lord and my God. And I have to tell you, kids, that is a most wonderful conclusion for all of us following in Easter, that our wonderful Jesus not only died for us, but he rose again mm -hmm. and gives us all great, great hope. God gave us eyes for this, and one day we will see him face to face. We'll be as happy as doubting Thomas, who had faith in the end. Bless him. Thank you, Barry. Um, just a, a few notices. Uh, this evening, Sunday's at seven. Uh, we're starting a new series this evening. So if you've not been coming uh, before and you might may be thinking about joining, tonight will be a good time. Um, we're beginning um, a series on the seven churches in Revelation. Um, so do come along, seven o'clock this evening. Um, just a couple of reminders. Can I remind people, please, about the data protection forms? Um, we do want to get our direct, uh, fellowship directory up and running because there are uh, new people that have joined whose uh, names need to go in. Um, but at the moment, we're still missing uh, quite a few of these forms. It is important because we can't put your names in the fellowship directory um, without your permission to do so. So if you haven't already sent it, um, please could you do so. If you've got a problem, uh, then let us know. Um, if you're somebody who's been um, coming along over the uh, last year, uh, maybe, and you would like your details to be put in the fellowship directory, this is a directory that goes out to the fellowship so that if they want to contact somebody, they can. Um, do let the church office know. Um, uh, next, um, we've come to the time when we are uh, considering opening church again, and this will be really great to be back in here, and for those of us that are, are here this morning to actually be able to see people in the chairs, um, that would be great. Um, possibly next Sunday, um, we will let you know, um, but it would be really great to uh, be able to come and worship together physically. We will still be streaming uh, face, uh, Facebook, YouTube, and on Zoom uh, for those of you who are not ready to come back yet or unable to do so. Um, so that will be good, something to look forward to. Carol, Carol Murray, as some of you um, will, will know, um, uh, passed away a few weeks ago. Um, if you've known Carol and you would like to be part of uh, the funeral, there are some spaces left. It's on April the 15th um, at 12 o'clock. And if you would like to go, um, if you could get in touch with me and I will give you details. Um, her daughter is very, um, very much wanting it to be a reflection of Carol's faith. And uh, she would like uh, as many people from the church as could go uh, to be there. So. Um, if you knew Carol and you'd like to be part of that, do let me know. And lastly, you should have received um, an email yesterday at some point about uh, Watford Schools Trust, um, an exciting, fun evening online on Friday, the April the 23rd. Um, it'd be good for us to support this. Um, so do look at the email and uh, have a look and see if it's something that you would uh, feel like you would want to do. We're now going to um, listen to a testimony. It's always good to hear how um, people uh, either have come to Christ or what he means to them uh, during the course of their everyday life. And last Sunday, if you joined with us, uh, we heard Elizabeth's testimony 
And today we're going to hear a short testimony from Iris, after which we will uh, sing. Hi everyone, a thing that I would like to share with you about becoming a Christian is that before, my life was kind of grey. I focused on the things that I didn't have, such as having the latest Nintendo or the latest phone, or even being part of the cool kids. But then, once I became a Christian, I realised that God had given me so many things that I could be thankful for, such as my friends and my family, although they can be a bit annoying, but most of all, God's love for me, in which he took away all of my sins and made me new. Now that is awesome. Brilliant, definitely is awesome. Um, go Iris, um, that's great. Uh, really good to be reminded of God's love for us. Um, we're going to sing uh, a new hymn now, actually, that I've come across in the last few months and um, feels quite appropriate to these times that we're living in, I think. So hopefully you will uh, enjoy it as we learn this together.
we come to a time of intercessory prayers. I always call it a huge privilege, the privilege of prayer, that we can come to God anytime. We do not need a special appointment. Because of the great work Christ has done for us, we can come with boldness, knowing that he hears us. I'd like to start by reminding us of the words in Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5, where it tells us to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. I've tried to put the prayers into different sections, and I know I may have missed out some, so as we pray, we pray along together. If anything you remember, you can add it into the prayers. We pray with the confidence that God hears us. And so for Thanksgiving, we want to thank God for the wonderful things he already does. We had a wonderful testimony from David Wood last week, which was read to us of how a blood clot in his heart was miraculously healed through the power of prayer. We also want to thank God for young Nathan, whom we have been praying for, and a recent scan has shown that he is in remission from cancer. We remember also Louis, Barry Stokes' grandson, who is also making good progress and starting to make plans for the future. We thank God also for Andy Such, who has also made a remarkable recovery following treatment for cancer. We also thank God that Pauline Bishop is now home from hospital and making good progress and for any other topics for thanksgiving that we remember, let us pray. Father, we are so thankful for the so many, many things you do for us, things we cannot even see. We thank you that there are so many benefits you place upon our lives. We thank you that whenever we pray, you do hear us and you answer. And for all these topics we have put before you, we want to express our thanks and gratitude, knowing that you love us and you care for every little detail of our lives. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the next section I want us to pray for is for those who are still in need of God's healing touch. We remember Maria Chapman's brother, Simon, who has been readmitted to hospital. We remember Tina, who is the daughter-in-law of Val Hubbard, suffering from terminal cancer. We pray for peace and calm. We remember Richard, brother to James Wilson. We remember Ryan Nakovic, whom we have been praying for, he has made some recovery, but we pray that the good work God has started in his life will come to completion. We are also praying for continued provision for him and his family. We remember Audrey McCracken, who still has some pain in her legs. Robert Chapman's sister, Lucy, who suffers with ME and CFS and is particularly unwell at this time. We remember Mike Glue, who has made some progress, but is now having to adjust to some lifestyle changes. We remember Harry, who is brother to Rose Cruz, waiting for medical and surgical treatment. We also remember Barry Payne, who is making recovery, but we pray for complete healing. We remember also Becky D and her sister Abby, that they would both feel and see God's hand in their situation. 
At the same time, we also thank God that Becky has recently received a job offer, and that's a sign that God is already at work. We also remember an anonymous lady who is connected to us, but she needs prayer because she's going for testing for ovarian cancer. And of course, I must have missed out some. So whoever you remember, please let us pray for all of these. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that as we have just sung today, you are a God who can move mountains. We pray for all the situations that we have brought before you. We pray your healing touch upon each and every one. Thank you, Lord, that you know us individually. You know where we hurt, and you know exactly what healing needs to be done. Father, we present these before you. We pray that you will comfort, you will touch them, you will bring healing, you will bring your grace to surround them. Father, heal in such a way that it will be clear that this is from you, and the glory will go back unto you. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want us now to remember those who are bereaved in one way or the other. We remember the family of Carol Murray, who has just passed away. We are told the funeral is on the 15th. We remember Ian Lloyd and his family, who are mourning the loss of his father. We also continue to pray for Hillary and her family, who are mourning the loss of her mother. We remember Pearl and her family who are mourning the loss of her husband, Ken. We remember Richard Bastable and his family mourning the loss of his father. And we pray especially for Richard's mother who is adjusting to life on her own. We remember the Anderson family who are mourning the loss of their young son. We remember also Sarah and Johnny and family who are mourning the loss of their twins through miscarriage. And of course, we remember the queen and the royal family at this time as they are mourning the loss of the Duke of Edinburgh, a loving husband for many years. I'm sure you will all remember other people that need prayer in this regard. So let's put them all in our prayers. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you love us so. You care for every aspect of our lives. We bring all these people who are bereaved and are mourning the loss of loved ones. Father, we pray your comforting arms around them. We pray your provision where provision is needed. We pray people around them that will speak comforting and soothing words. We pray that even in their fields of mourning, Father, that something will draw them close to you. Father, I just pray your blessing upon each and every one of these families that you will restore them to good health. You will help them at this time to seek your face and that what may have been a tragedy could be turned to something good that will draw people to you, the true and living God, in Jesus' name. Amen. I have classed the last group into every other thing. And so we pray, especially for our leadership team in our church at this time, as we go through a time of interregnum. There are so many meetings, organizations, and things to be done. So we pray for them that God will give them wisdom, unity, courage, and the strength they need to carry on. We pray for our ongoing Alpha course. We pray for our youth and children's work, especially for the excellent productions of Easter Madness, Pancake Madness, and all the other madnesses. They may sound funny, but I believe that these are great opportunities that are sowing seeds that will lead to the harvest we're looking for. So let's pray for all of that. Let's 
pray for those who give of their time, talent, and efforts to put these programs together. Let us also remember our frontline workers, our key workers, who still have to go out every day to provide essential services, that God will give them the strength and the protection they need. Let us pray. Loving Father, we come once more to thank you that you know our individual needs. Thank you for the work that you enable us to do to bring your name to the world, to proclaim you to children, to youths, and to other people. Father, we may not always get it right, but we pray that whatever we do that may seem like fun, that may seem like not making sense to others, would make sense to somebody, would sow a seed that would lead that person to come to seek out the Lord Jesus Christ one day. Lord, we bless you for our leadership team, the great work they put in, their talents, their time, their efforts. We pray your blessing upon each one of them. Lord, that you also meet them at their points of need. Lord, we pray for those who come to the Alpha course. There again, we believe that seeds are being sown. We pray your blessing upon that too. Bless all those who make it happen. We pray for our frontline workers. There are people in the NHS, our teachers, our shop workers, and others who have to go out in the midst of the pandemic. Father, we pray your continued protection and help for them. And Lord, we bring every other thing we may have forgotten, we bring all to you, knowing that you know us, you understand us, and Lord, you love us so much that you give us even more than we can ever think or ask for. We bless your holy name. Thank you, Lord, for the confidence you give us through Jesus Christ that when we pray, you hear us. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Selena. Um, <clears throat> just a few um, words from the ministry team uh, this morning. I'm able to find it now. Um, first one, Isaiah, uh, chapter 6 and verse 8. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. This is what um, somebody had as they prayed. Linked with that, this verse, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go. Psalm 143, verse 8. And then another word from Isaiah 12, 3. With joy you will draw water from wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, Sense God's saying, draw from him. Don't let yourself be distracted by other things. I'm in the well of life that satisf satisfies beyond anything. And the last one, again from Isaiah. But as the terebinth and the oaks leave <coughs> stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Thoughts that came with this were, many people feel they've been laid waste. God is saying that even though the stump has been cut down, the shoots are growing. He's bringing us new life. Look to him and trust that he will bring the harvest. And just before Maureen speaks to us, I'm just going to read um, from Jeremiah chapter 18 and verses 1 to 6. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was ma <coughs> making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, 
just as this potter has done, says the Lord. Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Heavenly Father, we just pray for Maureen now as she comes to speak to, her, to us. And Lord, we just ask again that you will give us listening ears to hear what you have to say to each one of us individually this morning. Lord, we just pray that you will just bless her as she brings your word to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just get myself organised here. I want to start off by saying thank you to everybody for allowing me to come along and share with you this morning. Um, most of you know I'm the minister of Leavesden Road Baptist Church and uh, since the beginning of the first lockdown we haven't managed to go back to church at all. So all of our services are produced in my lounge, in my flat, and uh, I pre-record them and put them up onto YouTube so people can uh, watch them at any time. One of the benefits of that is that Sunday mornings are free for me. So I've been able to sometimes join in bushy services and services in other churches, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to do that, both as somebody who, as it were, sits in the congregation but occasionally goes to places to be able to preach. But this is the first time in over a year I've actually preached in a church, <laughs> as opposed to to myself on my computer with nobody else. So as much as there might be little response from the few people who are here, it's far more than I get in my lounge. <laughs> so to the passage for today, many of you will know that um, I used to live in Pakistan. Let's see if this works. Hooray. I used to live in Pakistan, um, and for the latter part of my time there, um, I lived up in the foothills of the Himalayas. Beautiful place to live. I used to look out on those beautiful mountains from my bedroom window. My office looked out onto more mountains. Beautiful. As part of uh, my role in that part of the country, I was to go out and speak with people who lived around us, as well as teaching in the school that I was uh, assigned to. Just down the road from where I lived, there was a potter, and he had a shop. And I went along there quite frequently, and I used to buy pottery from him. Anybody who's seen my house on Zoom, you probably see it in the background. There's lots of blue and white pottery, and that's the pottery that comes from this very potter's shed that I've referred to. The man in there would make me gifts and presents for the potter. And here's some of the things, oh, she says, hoping it will go. It's not going on. There we go. So blue and white pottery and uh, lots of different things. And he was always looking for new ideas of how he could use the same traditional skills that he'd heard of to make new things. And I was the one who gave him those ideas. They never quite turned out how I pictured them. But that's because he was the potter, not me. And some of the things I was trying to suggest that he might make were things that he knew were not good ideas for pottery. But in my house, I have a clock that's made of this pottery. I have a tea service made of this pottery, I have mugs, I have a vase. From time to time, I myself went in and had a go. I wasn't very good at it, needless to say. And for me, as I was coming to do some of that pottery and in his place, 
there were times when I would just want to give up. And he'd say, no, no, it's okay, keep going. And then we, I would get so far, and there'd be a bit on the side, and I didn't know what to do with it. So I would pick it up and go to throw it away and discard it. And he'd say, no, 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 don't discard it. You can make something from that. Now, I bought a piece of my pottery with me, and it's here. Now, most of you probably can hardly see it because it's so small. But that's the point. Because the piece of discarded clay that I tried to throw away the day I tried it, the potter then took that piece of discarded clay and made this for me. It's a candlestick. And when you live in a place that doesn't have electricity very often, this is a very important thing. But it was made out of the castaway pottery, the castaway clay that to me meant nothing. But to the potter, it meant something. There's my introduction. Now let's get to the passage. I love Jeremiah. Jeremiah is one of my favorite prophets, partly because he's got lots of hopeful things that he says in his prophecies. And we often pick up on those and we take them. How many of us know that verse? I am doing a new thing in you. And we quote it all the time. How many of us have read this passage that we heard of today and we claim it all the time for ourselves, that he is the potter and we are the clay? But you know what? That was Jeremiah giving a prophecy in the midst of chaos, in the midst of things falling apart. His ministry went across many years. It started in the time when Josiah was bringing reform and trying to get people to come back to God. It carried on later on in Jehoiakim's time. Read his prophecies. They're great. It even has a ministry that he has for the people when they're in exile. The worst thing that they can think of. And he says that verse that we quote so often, I have a plan for you to prosper you. He says that to them while they're in exile. That's the context of it. So it's disastrous as far as they're concerned. But Jeremiah reminds them in various contexts why it is that they need to continue to trust in God and return to him. And this passage is no different. So as I look at it, I see three different things that I want us to look at today. The potter, the potter's will, and the clay. And you'll all have heard sermons on this before, and you will not be surprised at who I think is who. But the potter is God, the creator of all things, who wants to take and mould us. The potter's will, our life circumstance. And the clay, that's us. We have to remember that it's the potter who has absolute control over the clay in that context. But if that potter does not focus completely on what they're doing, the clay will slip off. God is always there with us, but he holds us with a loose rein because we are allowed to make decisions for ourselves, to make choices. The clay is in his hands and he wants to make a vessel out of each one of us. That was the message that Jeremiah was to give to the people. You have turned against me, God was saying to them. You've longed after things that are not within the covenant relationship that we agreed. You've longed to be somebody that you shouldn't be. I love that point in Iris's uh, testimony earlier on, that when she was in the grey mode, she longed after things like the best of everything, the latest phone, this, that and the other. Nothing wrong with any of those things in and of themselves, 
but that desire that you should be part of the cool group, that you should be longing after those things. But when God enters us and we look for a relationship with him, those things are nothing. And this is what this picture of this potter in the potter's house, this is the picture that's given here. He says, you're like a lump of clay. Now notice when God says to Jeremiah, did you, uh, could I not mould you in the same way? He doesn't say, I will mould you in the same way, like it or lump it. What he's saying is he is the sovereign God and he has the capability of doing that. But we have this thing called free choice. And sometimes we choose the wrong things. But in this picture, he wants to say, come back to me, hold on to me. Be, let me mold you into what I want. Don't try and be what the world wants. Let me mold you. So there's the potter who is God. And he has ultimate control. He is sovereign and can control the uh, clay. But the clay needs to be pliable and ready to be moulded. There's a sense when you think about the potter and the clay that this potter has an intense interest in the clay. Immediately you see that wheel spinning and you see the clay on it and he's got it positioned. You can see the focus is on that creation and only that creation and primarily the potter's the only one that will know from the beginning what it's going to look like at the end well if it were mine nobody would know what it was going to look like at the end but a professional potter they have a good idea of what it would look like my friend the potter who lived down the road he would say to me there is no point in making something that is sitting on the side and pretty just for the sake of it being pretty. It needs to have a use. What's the point, he would say, of making something just for the sake it's pretty? He had no sense that to make something that was pretty, that was fine, but it had to have a use as well. We are his workmanship. God puts time and effort into us. He takes patience and has patience with the clay. The people of Israel, and each one of us, if we're honest, are people who don't always follow exactly the way God would want us to. Even if in our hearts we really want to do that, we don't always. But... We also know that there's a need for us to follow after him and he wants to mould us and we'll take patience. Whenever the people went away, God said, I'll still be here. I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes it's like being on the potter's wheel where you're being moulded but you don't know quite what you want to be at the end of it. You want God to mould you, but you actually can't cope with the process. That brings me on to the wheel. The potter's wheel spins. One of the other things I learned from my potter friend was that the wheel spins at different speeds dependent on what the creator, the potter, is doing to the piece of clay at times. Now, for all of us, probably in this day and age, just right now, with all that's going on around us, and probably for the last year, we're feeling a bit dizzy. You know, I used to use the phrase, stop the world, I want to get off. Well, maybe here it's the, stop the potter's wheel, I want to get off. And more than being centred in the middle, we feel like we're at the edge of the potter's wheel and we're holding off holding on for dear life rather than being sent off into oblivion. But you know what? The potter says, 
It's okay that I'm here to grab hold and to bring you back into the centered place. When you think about it, that's exactly what happens with God. That's what he's saying in this passage. He's talking about the clay that is marred, that is ruined to all intents and purposes. That isn't a fresh piece of clay, but he doesn't put it away. He reworks that ruined, marred clay. And God is saying to the people through Jeremiah, and he's saying to us today, you may have gone away, you may have turned your back on me, you may never have acknowledged me ever, you may see yourself as a marred piece of clay, but, says God, I am reaching out to you. I am here and ready to centre you back in the middle of the wheel so that I can rework you and remould you into the beautiful vessel that I want to use. The circumstances of our life will bring us to the point where we may be crying out to God. The trials that we feel in our lives will be those where we want to cry out to God. And he says, it's okay, I'm here. I can take out all those bubbles. I can take out the stones that have marred you. I can rework this piece of clay in order to make you the person, the vessel that I want to use. Trials is something we all know about. But God says, I'm there beside you. Sometimes it's rebuke, and that's what this was that Jeremiah was bringing to the people. It was a rebuke because they had gone against him. It was a rebuke to them that they needed to have more faith in God. They needed to trust in him. And if that meant walking blindly, it meant walking blindly. But they needed to do it. And God was rebuking them. And sometimes in our lives, God rebukes us. But in that rebuke, there is always, as Jeremiah constantly does, a hope that is prophesied, a hope that is given, that God is there and he is the one who will reform, who will reshape, who will remould to create that special thing. And our circumstances, every single person that Jeremiah was talking to in that day and age had their own reasons for the actions that they took. Every single one of us have circumstances in our lives that may become between us and our God and relationship that we have with him. But God says, trust me in the midst of that. I want to just give a quick illustration here um, of walking blindly with God. Going back to my Potter friend, his daughter was getting married once. Now, he had this potter's house just along from where I live, but his family lived down the mountainside. I was 7,000 feet up was where my house was at that point. And his family lived down the mountainside. And he invited us to the wedding in this house. We walked to the edge where he met us and he said, I will be your guide to get to the house. We had one torch between seven of us. And he said to us, there are no lights on this pathway. There is nothing that you can see at all. But I have a torch, he said. So he lined us up with a hand on each, like one hand on the shoulder of the person in front of us. And then he was at the front with the torch, which he put behind him so that somebody could see rather than him. And he walked. Now, he walked this path every day. He knew it well. It took us 45 minutes, but we walked with him blindly 
not knowing where we were going. We had a great time. We stayed the night rather than walk back up in the dark. It was about a thousand feet down the mountainside that we had walked. And the next morning, when we got up, this was the path that we saw. This was the widest part of the path that we saw. And we had walked a thousand feet down and were very grateful none of us had gone over the edge. But we trusted him because he knew the way and he did it every day and he was the one with the torch. Sometimes, in the midst of the shaping and remoulding of us, we have to trust in God blindly. And in these days, in this last year and in the coming days, isn't that what we're doing? Trusting God blindly for what the future might hold for each and every one of us. Certainly, I know that's the case in our church at Leavesden Road. We are trusting God to show us that way. But then we get to the point of we've got God the potter and the wheel and all the spinning and all that happens there. And we come to the point where we are the clay that he is moulding. What should our response be? I think that we need to see ourselves as something with potential. I used to hate that word when I was at school. It often appeared on my report. Maureen has great potential. She doesn't always meet it. But God sees the potential even in me. And he's willing to use it. Even if I can't see it, God can see the potential in me. God can see the potential in you. He could see the potential, if you like, in the people who had turned from him. And he gives Jeremiah this picture to put over to them and to talk to them about. Here we have this verse, and it comes from Isaiah. We are the clay, and he is the potter. And as we draw this to a close, I want us to think and apply this to ourselves as individuals. As you're sitting, whether you're at home, or whether you're here in the church building, I want you to think and visualise, we heard that earlier on, didn't we, with Barry, he was talking about what we can visualise in our minds, I, I want you to visualise the potter's will. I want you to visualise yourself as the clay on the potter's will. I want you to visualise God looking down on you as you are there on the potter's wheel. And it may be that today you have come to this place and come to the place where you feel that life's a bit of a dizzy whirl and that that potter's wheel, if you like, is moving a lot faster than you would like it to. It's going at such a speed that you can hardly recognise things that are going round. You see them, but they whiz by. And you don't understand what's going on. Remember, if that's how you feel today, that God the potter is there to keep you centred if you just rely on him, even if it means walking blindly with him and trust in him. In the midst of all of that whirling around, in the midst of all of the uncertainty, God is there to keep you centered. Now it may be that for you, the wheel is not turning quite so speedily. It may be that the wheel is a lot slower. And perhaps you even think, God's put me to one side. He hasn't got a use for me because I'm not in the Russian whirl of what's going on. And you're disappointed because you think maybe God thinks you're worthless. Maybe God doesn't want you to be 
part of his plan anymore. Maybe he has nothing for you. Maybe you even question whether he's deserted you. If my potter friend were here today, he would tell you that the wheel slows down at the point that the potter needs to put the finer details onto the pot. If there is something intricate that needs to be done, the wheel has to slow often in order for him to be able to do that. God wants to create each of us as individuals and as a church as you look to the future and the new minister that you're going to have, as you continue to be God's people here in this place. He wants to mould and shape every single individual in order to be able to mould and shape the wider church, in order to be able to mould and shape this community. Watford and everyone in it, and indeed the whole world. God, the creator, says, come back to me. Let me reshape you. Whatever circumstance you find yourself in today, may you know God's hand upon you. May you know him really working in you and through you. Just come to him and say, I want you to show me your vision for me as the potter. I want to be that clay that's pliable and mouldable in your hands. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Maureen. As we um, draw to a close of our service, um, we are just going to uh, sing again. Um, can I remind you that uh, even though we're not physically in church at the moment, the prayer ministry team does still exist. And if there's anything that you want prayer over, uh, do get in touch with the office and uh, Melissa will put you in touch with somebody. We're still there to be able to pray for you. Um, so do get in touch. Thank you, Joe.
Hallelujah. You reign. You are sovereign over us. God, we praise you because you are in control. We praise you because you are the potter. That you um, have a, a design for our lives. That you have that image in your mind's eye of what you would have us to be. And Lord, even when we don't understand what that feels like, and even when the circumstances don't make sense, Lord, we put our trust in you because we know that you are molding and shaping us. And Lord, we invite you to do that. We ask that you would make us into what you would have us be. And we thank you uh, that you love us, that you hold us, that you center us on that potter's wheel. And we praise you this morning. Amen. And may the blessing of God, the Almighty One, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us all as we go from here and into this week. Amen. Amen. That brings the uh, service to the uh, formal close. Um, but if you are on Zoom, then please do join the breakout groups. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>